And when I speak of the UN failure, most of the people don't get the real picture. Having been in Rwanda during the period of the genocide against the Tutsi, and uh, being at the forefront of the UN work in Rwanda as a deputy humanitarian coordinator, could you share some insight pertaining to why the UN failed so this morning in Rwanda? What were the challenges at the time? And what reasons uh, that have been drawn from that failure? Thank you, Manuel. Very, <laughs> very interesting question. I, I have to admit that before I came here, I, I was actually very uncomfortable answering this question because the story I have to share with you is a bad story, and it's a bad story of today. But having looked at the panels and, and listened yesterday to, to the young, and, and having sensed especially the hope that you see in these panels, in people, in the youth, in the survivors, in the, the, um, those who protected, you, you see the energy, you see the hope, and in that sense, you know, tout protocole respecté, I think you guys can take the bad message. The second, me the second sort of caveat or introduction, you no know, sort of initial point, I, I will talk only from my experience, and, and so I will only talk about issues that I have been deeply involved in. So I will talk about Somalia, I was in Somalia from, but I will only do it in three minutes, so don't, no, horror, no problem. Talk about Somalia, I was in Somalia from uh, August 92 to April 94. I was again in Somalia in 2006, and then after resigning from the UN again in Somalia. I will talk about Myanmar. I was in Myanmar from 2003 to 2007, I was the UN representative in Myanmar. Uh, I then, after having left the UN from 2012 to 2015, was involved in facilitating the dialogue between the armed groups and uh, the government in the, in the peace process. And then over the last two years, I have been writing policy papers from Somalia, going into Somalia for the Norwegian government. So to answer your question, and, and the last bit, because it is slightly relevant, I'm also now currently doing work in Syria. I, I'm working with the Syrian opposition. So to answer your question, I, I would humbly say that General Dallaire did not fail in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. I would humbly suggest that he represents the best of what the UN is during those, 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 uh, those days in Rwanda, the, those months in Rwanda. He was left with very little force, with a very constrained mandate, and having worked directly with him, he did everything he could with the little he, he had. It's the Security Council that failed Somalia, and of course, uh, not Somalia, failed Rwanda. Rwanda. And of course, yeah, Security Council. But they did deliberately. I think what we need to remember is that the plane was shot down two weeks after the last troops, the last American UN troops, left the shores of Mogadishu in total humiliation. There was absolutely no appetite to get involved in Rwanda. You had a, a, a US government that came up with a Presidential Dir Directive 25, which stated that from then on, the US would only intervene in situations of national interest. Yeah. The, the US on the Security Council did everything it could initially to ensure that there would be no peacekeeping force, no effort, because they didn't want to be humiliated by the fact of not participating in such a mission. One shouldn't forget that the government at the time, the Rwandan government at the time, was on the Security Council. They were defining the narrative that the Security Council was, 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 was getting. So, so, so initially, there was no desire to intervene. There was a, there was a, 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 you know, a cognizant, position of not intervening. It changed. It changed in May, more or less. But by then, three quarters of the people were already dead. Three quarters of your, your people were massacred. What are the lessons that have been learned from... Uh, and and, and so, so what is clear is that Rwanda paid the price for the failure of the first post-Cold War international intervention in Somalia. Rwanda paid the 
the price for Somalia. Syria today has paid the price for Libya. The coalition that existed behind the Libyan intervention that was by certain seen as being abused has broken any form of coalition on Syria. The Syrian people are paying the price for the, the Libya's failure. Yeah. What are the lessons? Many lessons. Many uh, fantastic ability to, to analyze. You know, we mechanisms that have been put in place. <laughs> My friend Adam is here. Institutions within the UN to try and deal with them. But ultimately, what? How has that changed for the Tamil who was stuck in the Vani pocket during the last year of the Sri Lankan war? How has that changed for the Rohingya who, who have for years lived under oppression and abuse and then were expulsed from, from, from uh, northern Rakhine? For me, Sri Lanka and Myanmar are also results of the international community's desire not to intervene. Sri Lanka, the international community in the West did not want to intervene because the LTT, this was the post 9-11 war on terror world. The LTTE was a terrorist organization using suicide bombing as one of their instruments of, of, of conflict. The West was happy to see the Sri Lankan government eliminate the LTTE. The cost, as Emmanuel said, I conducted the review of, uh, of the UN's uh, operations in uh, Sri Lanka. I would argue the cost 50,000 dead. The world would not intervene in Myanmar at the beginning because in the West we love fairy tales and Myanmar was a fairy tale. You had an iconic uh, leader who could do absolutely no wrong, the international community was unwilling to see the anti-Muslim sentiments that existed in the country, was unwilling to see how these anti-Muslim sentiments were actually were more than endorsed. They, actually, they, they, were, they were mainstreamed even within this, the, 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 the icon. So at the beginning, the international community in the West would not take the issue of the Rohingya seriously, would not take the issue of, of, uh, of anti-Muslim sentiment seriously. So all this to say that it is definitely not a happy story. I mean, what I'm saying at the beginning is the UN is an incredibly, it's, it's, a, it's a collective of multiple facets. So, so I think a, the peacekeeping operations, I think the, 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 the yeah, oh, no, let me do it differently. What I'm saying is that the UN is a mechanism that provides huge opportunity and should provide hope for the people. Yeah. The center of the UN has a secretary general that is committed to a fundamental reform, but has a bureaucracy that is resisting it completely. But then on the ground, Bec and and, and in, the in a way, the UN on the you know, at the center is, is sort of so occupied with itself that on the ground, what the general was saying and others, you can have a very effective response, but it's very much limited to, to the, the, the quality of, 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 of the actor. The other thing I'm saying is in complex political context where you would hope, so not the peacekeeping, where you would hope to see an entity that would be able to grapple with the politics that lead to violence, right now, the UN is not capable to do that. And for me, Myanmar is the tragic example of lessons that were not learned from Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Charles.